Thank you, Cameron. Um, one of the things that maybe you do the same thing, I have, I have certain things that I consider uh, kind of touchstones, either favorite poems or poets, favorite authors or activists or movies, things that help ground me, things that um, speak to my heart, speak to my soul, call my conscience, and just remind me of how I want to be in this world. One of those is the night watch service that Reverend Barber, uh, when he launched the Poor People's Campaign in 2016, he did a watch night service. And sometimes I watch the full service, but sometimes I just watch this excerpt from Valerie Carr, who started the organization Revolutionary Love. I hope that you, if you haven't seen it before, um, that you'll find as, as inspirational as I do. On Christmas Eve, 103 years ago, my grandfather waited in a dark and dank cell. He sailed by steamship across the Pacific Ocean from India to America, leaving behind colonial rule. But when he landed on American shores, immigration officials saw his dark skin, his tall turban worn as part of his sick faith, and saw him not as a brother, but as foreign, as suspect, threw him behind bars where he languished for months. Until a single man, a white man, a lawyer named Henry Marshall, filed a writ of habeas corpus that released him Christmas Eve, 1913. Mm. My grandfather, Kehar Singh, became a farmer, free to practice the heart of his sick faith, love and oneness. And so when his Japanese-American neighbors were rounded up and taken to their own detention camps in the deserts of America, he went out to see them when no one else would. He looked after their farms until they, reached, they returned home. He refused to stand down. Yes, in the aftermath of September 11, when hate violence exploded in these United States and a man that I called uncle was murdered, mm. I tried to stand up. I became a lawyer like the man who freed my grandfather, and I joined a generation of activists fighting detentions and deportations, surveillance and special registration, hate crimes and racial profiling. And after 15 years, with every film, with every lawsuit, with every campaign, I thought we were making the nation safer for the next generation. Mama. And then my son was born. On Christmas Eve, I watched him ceremoniously put the milk and cookies by the fire for Santa Claus. And after he went to sleep, I then drank the milk and ate the cookies. I wanted him to wake up and see them gone in the morning. I wanted him to believe in a world that was magical. But I am leaving my son a world that is more dangerous than the one that I was given. Because I am raising, we are raising, a brown boy in America. A brown boy who may someday wear a turban as part of his faith. And in America today, as we enter an, an era of enormous rage, as white nationalists hail this moment as their great awakening, as hate acts against Sikhs and our Muslim brothers and sisters are at an all-time high, I know I know that there will be moments, whether on the streets or in the schoolyard, where my son will be seen as foreign, as suspect, as a terrorist. Just as black bodies are still seen as criminal, brown bodies are still seen as illegal, trans bodies are still seen as immoral, indigenous bodies are still seen as savage, the bodies of women and girls seen as someone else's property. And when we see these bodies, not as brothers and sisters,
then it becomes easier to bully them, to rape them, to allow policies that neglect them, that incarcerate them, that kill them. Ah, mama. Yes, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The future is dark. On this New Year's Eve, this watch night, I close my eyes and I see the darkness of my grandfather's cell. And I can feel the spirit of ever-rising optimism in the Sikh tradition, Chardikala, within him. And so the mother in me asks, what if? What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our America... and genocide, slavery and Jim Crow, detentions and political assault, what if they're whispering in our ear today, tonight, you are brave? What if this is our nation's great transition? because that's a hard act to follow, right? <laughs> oh. Nice, nice, nice transition. <laughs> oh. Okay. This morning we sang, together we sang these words, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy place, when we see our faces in each other's eyes, when we hear our voices in each other's words, when we feel the power of each other's faith, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. Our heart is in a holy place. It's beautiful. Our heart is a holy place. Us Unitarian Universalists, we have a wide range of individual beliefs. We're probably one of the few religions where you can find people who are atheists or non-theists alongside people who are theists, people who hold a belief in a higher power that they describe in God language or maybe perhaps in goddess language, worshiping together side by side being in community with one another. We feel the power of each other's faith. And yet, in our diversity of experiences and diversity of belief, we ground ourselves in shared commitments, shared principles, shared values. Throughout our history as Unitarians, as Universalists, and as Unitarian Universalists, we ground ourselves in a shared commitment to love. In the words of our most public advocacy and social action campaign, we side with love. We side with love. A little more than a year ago, a small commission of UU ministers, religious educators, and lay leaders with input from congregations all across the country wrote for our consideration as Unitarian Universalists, we covenant congregation to congregation and through our association to support 
and assist one another in our ministries, we draw from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage, building on the foundation of love. We covenant. One of my favorite definitions and descriptions of covenant comes from the UU minister and religious educator Candy Rogers, who describes covenant in this way. A covenant is a sacred promise that we make together for how we want to be together in order to make the world a better place. A covenant is a sacred promise that we make together for how we want to be together in order to make the world a better place. As we covenant congregation to congregation and through our association to support one another in our ministries. I think that line is really just so relevant to us and to our sibling congregation Prairie Circle over in nearby Gray's Lake. Here we are, we've entered into covenant with one another to support each other in our ministries. You'd think they wrote that just for us. <laughs> and that commission, the people who wrote this commission, they remind us that our covenant, our sacred promise is grounded in love. We draw from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage, building on the foundation of love. A foundation of love. A foundation of love that's been built throughout our UU history and our heritage. From the Unitarian minister, James Villa Blake, who writing in 1893 wrote, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. To more recent in that same teal hymnal that we were singing from this morning, um, composer Jason Sheldon proclaiming that we are answering the call of love, hands joined together as hearts beat as one, emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim that we are answering the call of love. He wrote those words in 2004 and then just updated it eight years ago. There is the popular telling and retelling of the historical fiction in which we imagine the 16th century Unitarian king from Transylvania, King Francis David, saying, we need not think alike to love alike. Our D.R.E. Heather has that on a button on her, her wall. I noticed that when we were talking together. As often as we've said that statement, historians cannot find anywhere where Francis David ever said that. Um, <laughs> but it's been told so often and for so long, we don't know how the, that story started. But even though it's a story that's not historically accurate, it's become true in our hearts. It's become true in our imaginations. It's a statement of who we strive to be. We need not think alike to love alike. Our UU faith calls us to be part of doing the transformative work toward bringing the world yet to be into being, even if it's just for small moments even if it's just in our homes, in our congregations, in our neighborhoods, our communities, and in our world. We're building on a foundation of love. And in the pro proposed words of that reviewed, revised UU covenant, let me try that one more time, in the proposed words of our revised UU covenant that we're reflecting on and being considered in UU congregations throughout the country, building on a foundation of love is described this way. Love is the power that holds us together and is the center of our shared values. We are accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Those words that I've been sharing are the um, UU covenant that's found in Article 2 that Jesse mentioned this morning. Um, 
Those are proposed updates and revisions that are being considered, discussed, and reflected on in congregations throughout the country and being voted on this June. Together we're going to decide, is this our sacred promise for how we want to be together to make the world a better place? But this morning, I really don't want to talk about Article 2. I want to acknowledge the good work that's been happening there, the great discussions that have been happening. But I really want to talk about love and the deep and abiding connection between love and liberation. If any of us can only read one book about love, I need to grab it from my book. I don't know if you've read this. It's all about love by Bell Hooks. If you're not familiar with Bell Hooks, um, Bell Hooks is a black queer feminist writer, educator, activist who wrote her first book of poetry when she was 19 and continued to write up till she passed away just two years ago. She's written over 40 books in her lifetime. Books of poetry, essays, books of nonfiction, um, even a few children's books. And this one, though, she, in so many of her books, she talks about love and talks about liberation. And in All About Love, she describes love not as a feeling, but as a verb, as an action, as a choice, as an ethic. She writes, love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. And she tells us, we do not have to love. We choose to love. And then goes on to define love in this way. When we understand love as the will to nurture our own and another's spiritual growth, it becomes clear that we cannot claim to love if we are hurtful and abusive. Love and abuse cannot coexist. And she states that love is not possible without justice and that the cultural and social systems of domination and oppression that we see around us are anti-love. She says there can be no love without justice. Abuse and neglect negate love. Care and affirmation, the opposite of abuse and humiliation, are the foundation of love. It is a testimony to the failure of loving practice that abuse is happening in the first place. And in looking around in the world around us, she says, I feel our nations turning away from love moving into a wilderness of spirit so intense we may never find our way home again. I write of love to bear witness both to the danger in this moment and to call for a return to love. This is the revolutionary love that Valerie Carr calls us to. The revolutionary love project it emphasizes the transformative power of love and encourages us to love ourselves, to love those who are in harm's way, and probably most difficult, um, loving those with whom we are in opposition. The declaration of revolutionary love is described in this way. We declare our love for all those who are in harm's way. Refugees, immigrants, Muslims, Sikhs, Jews, queer and trans people, black people, indigenous people, Asian Americans, Latinx people, the disabled, women and girls, working class people and poor people. We vow to see one another as brothers, sisters, and siblings. Our humanity binds us together, and we vow to fight for a world where all of us can flourish. We declare love even for our opponents. We oppose policies that threaten the rights and dignity of any person. We vow to fight not with violence or vitriol, 
but by challenging the cultures and institutions that promote hate. In this way, we challenge our opponents through the ethic of love. We declare love for ourselves. We will protect our capacity for joy. We will rise and we will dance. We will honor our ancestors whose body, breath, and blood call us to a life of courage. In their name, we choose to see this darkness not as the darkness of the tomb, but of the womb. We will breathe and push through the pain of this era to birth a new future. Love is an intention and love is an action. We choose love. We challenge the cultures and institutions that promote hate, and we do so through an ethic of love. And whenever this does not seem possible, I remember and consider Polly Murray. I don't know if you're familiar with Polly Murray, another, another touchstone. Polly Murray was a poet, a lawyer, an Episcopal priest, a black woman of mixed racial heritage, a person who lived outside of the gender binary. Polly often referred to themselves as she, he in their writings, and Polly's beloved Aunt Pauline uh, referred to Polly as her boy girl. It was Polly's brilliant legal scholarship that informed the work that Thurgood Marshall did in the fight for desegregation. And it's her work that continues to inform some of the legal fights for transgender rights. Polly defied the boundaries of race and of gender in our legal system, in their life, in their theology and ministry, and in their poetry. Polly Murray challenged the cultures and institutions that promote hate. And the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray chose to live an ethic of love and, and to widen the circle of love. In reflecting on their own life and work, Polly would say, I intend to do my part through the power of persuasion, by spiritual resistance, by the power of my pen, and by inviting violence upon my own body. For what is life itself without the freedom to walk proudly before God and man and to glorify creation through the genius of self-expression? I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods. When my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. Polly Murray. Polly Murray was blessed with love and amazing grace. So let us, let us widen our definition of love, a definition of love in which love and justice are inseparable, a courageous love, a revolutionary love, love that the artist and activist Vienna Rye proclaims that love is dismantling systems of oppression, an ethic of love that in intention and action we continually widen our circle of love. As Pauli Murray says, I shall draw a larger circle. I shall draw a larger circle. The world needs this wider and deeper love. The world needs our courageous love. The world needs your revolutionary love. Let us draw a wider in a more loving circle, and then our heart is in a holy place. May it be so. May we make it so. Amen. Ashe. And blessed be.